Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. I have another handheld device review for you today. This one is the Ioneo Geek. Now this one might look a little bit familiar to you and that's because I've reviewed one that's very similar to it before. And that device was also made by Ioneo and it is called the Ioneo 2 and this is it right here. Now there are a few differences between the two and that's what we'll kind of focus on in this video here. After all, they have the same chip inside and I've done two different videos, an emulation performance and a review video on the Ioneo 2. And so when it comes to what you can expect in terms of performance, it's going to be just about the same with Ioneo Geek. We'll go over a little bit when it comes to testing, but for the most part, what I want to show is the difference between the Ioneo 2 and the Ioneo Geek here. And I gotta say, the differences between the two are a little bit interesting. After all, this one is a little bit cheaper than the Ioneo 2, and it has what you may consider to be downgrades, but some of them I actually consider to be upgrades from the previous one. And so in this video, we're gonna do all those things I love to do in a review, which includes things like nitpicking the buttons and the screen. We'll also talk about the ergonomics and the feel of the plastic overall as well. And so while there are a bunch of similarities between the two, I'm sure we're gonna find lots to talk about. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, if you want to order the Ioneo Geek, you actually would go to the same place that you would order the Ioneo 2, because they are part of the same Indiegogo campaign. And so as you scroll down and see the different buying options, you'll see either the Geek or the 2 available for purchase. Now first thing that's going to strike you here is that the Indiegogo price here is $150 cheaper for the Geek than the 2. Now that price is for the lowest spec Fantasy Black model right here, and it's going to be $100 more when it actually hits retail. And so depending on when you're watching this video, the price will be between $850 and $950 to start. Now there are two different models for the Ioneo Geek. There's a black one here as well as a transparent purple model too. And the purple model was available for some early backers, but when they actually got delivered, they found that they had some cracking with the shell and there were some issues with backlight bleeding too. And so as I'm making this video right now, the black model is available, but the purple one, they've gone back and kind of reworked it. And so it's going to be a couple months, I think, before we see that one. And one thing to note here is the black model has an 800p resolution display. And so if you want to have the 1200p resolution that is found in the Ioneo 2, you would have to get the purple model. Now to complicate things even more, they did make 1200p displays on black models, but those were given to those who had ordered the transparent purple model. And it just so happens I have a black model with a 1200p display as well. However, if you were to try to buy one right now at the $850 price range, I would expect to get the 800p display anyway. One thing to note here, if you do plan on buying one, I would also recommend checking out the multi-dock they have available here for $89. I recently got one of these in the mail as well, and I have been loving it. In fact, I'm going to do a dedicated video on this thing because I've been enjoying it so much with various different handheld PCs. And so be on the lookout for that video here coming soon, but long story short, yeah, I actually really enjoy this thing. Okay, besides the display, there are some other differences between the Geek and the Ioneo 2. The first thing is that the Ioneo Geek will come with slower storage, so it has a PCIe 3 solid state drive. Now that being said, the motherboard actually has an interface for PCIe 4, so if you did want to upgrade your M.2 drive, you could do that. And one thing to note, it is capable of using double-sided SSDs. Now for many of the other features, they're going to be the same. For example, USB 4.0 with the Type-C interfaces. And you're also going to get LPDDR5 RAM clocked at 6400 megahertz. And of course, it's going to use that same Ryzen 7 6800U processor, and it has the same battery capacity as well of 50 watt hours. Now, two other differences worth noting is that the Ioneo 2 does have what they're calling linear motors for their rumble. Essentially, what this means is you will have double the rumble with dual axis motors. And with the Ioneo Geek, you'll just get some standard rumble motors. But to be honest, I didn't really tell a difference between the two while in gameplay. In fact, the only real difference I found was that the Ioneo 2 rumble is very strong, so I had to turn it down all the way. For the Ioneo Geek, I found that just keeping it at the moderate or medium level of rumble was just about right. Now, as I mentioned, I did get a 1200p display with my review unit from Ioneo, and so because of that, I cannot do a really good comparison between the two. And that's because these are the exact same panel, so when it comes to the brightness and the resolution and the color saturation, they're exactly the same. Now, that's honestly a great thing because I love the display on the Ioneo 2. I think it's super saturated and really nice to look at. But unfortunately, I can't really do a direct comparison between the standard 800p display on the Fantasy Black model. Now, there is one other thing that's kind of interesting about these two, and I wonder if you've noticed already. To be honest, it took me about a week to even notice the difference myself, and that is that the controls are slightly aligned differently on the top model than the bottom. If you look on the Ioneo 2, the joystick and the D-pad are aligned vertically, 
Meanwhile, on the iNeo Geek, the left joystick and the right face buttons have been pushed out a little bit closer to the edge of the device. And so I think the idea here was to make it a little bit more naturally ergonomic with your thumbs as you're holding the actual device. But to be honest, I never really had any major issues with the iNeo 2 anyway. It's one of those things that yes, maybe my thumbs were a little bit more vertically oriented than I would have liked, but honestly, after a few minutes of using it, I never even noticed it again. And I think the same thing could be said about the iNeo Geek. It's not something I even noticed in the first place. And so while I do appreciate that iNeo did make a concerted effort to make it more ergonomic, to be honest, I don't think it's a deal breaker one way or the other. As we'll talk about when it gets to the ergonomics piece, the analog stick placement and the D-pad and face buttons, they're absolutely fine on both models. And so in a nutshell, here's a listing from iNeo themselves, and I apologize if this is a little bit blurry, but this was the best resolution I could find. Anyway, up top here you can see there is some differences between the two, including most of the things I went over. The only thing I didn't bring up is that it does use a different fingerprint sensor for each model, but to be honest, they both work the same for me as well. And so again, much like with those controls, I don't really find it to be a deal breaker either way. There are a couple other planned special features like this sound tap magic thing that's supposed to give you different vibration depending on the sound, but that hasn't been implemented yet, so I'm not really going to get into detail about any of that stuff anyway. Alright, so let's move over to the unboxing portion of the video. Now, the unboxing experience with iNeo devices has always been really good. They definitely take a little bit of extra time when it comes to presentation, and it's always fun to open up these boxes. Inside, you'll get a quick user manual that will show off some button diagrams, and they also have this new feature right here. Essentially, they have these little stickers now that will allow you to remove the rubber pads in case you need to access the screws. Also inside, we have our standard suite of peripherals. So we have our USB-C adapters, as well as a 65 watt charging brick and charging cable, and then a bunch of different international adapters depending on where you live. For example, this one right here I think is from Antarctica. And now let's look at the device itself. First thing that sets it apart from the iNeo 2 for me is that it doesn't have a glass covering across the entire face. And so instead we have a more standard setup where we have the screen and bezel and then the plastic on the sides. But other than that, the design seems to be largely the same. The other initial observation that I made is that the texture of the handheld itself is a little bit different than I was expecting. The plastic on the iNeo 2 is a little bit slick feeling, but still has a nice grippiness to it. In fact, it's kind of hard to explain, but I would say that the plastic is so grippy that it feels almost a little bit squeaky when you actually rub your fingers across it. The other thing I noticed, at least on the model that I'm reviewing here, is that the tone of black between the front and the back cover is a little bit off. The front seems a little bit lighter than the back. Now, other than the controls, there are some other distinctions between the iNeo 2. First and foremost, there is one piece of glass across the entire thing. Other than the center part right here with the controls, this is a little bit rubbery feeling. And so this layout is very similar to the original PS Vita, and I went into detail about this in my iNeo 2 review. But as you can see here, yes, the iNeo 2 plastic is quite a bit slicker. It doesn't have as much grippiness to it. And honestly, when it comes to grippiness, I think they're both fine as far as handhelds go, but the Geek is just a little bit more grippy than the other. Now, in terms of just overall quality, I would say the iNeo 2 has a leg up just in the fact that that glass screen across the front is very impressive. And it does feel nice to have the edges of your fingers touching that glass. It just feels nice and cool and very elegant. Now for size comparisons, let's bring out the big boy. Here is the Steam Deck. Now each of these devices have the same screen dimensions, so a 7 inch screen with a 16 by 10 display. But as you can tell between the two, the Steam Deck is obviously longer than the other. Now when it comes to weight, there's not a big difference here. The iNeo Geek is about 5% lighter than the other. And the reason why the Geek is only a little bit smaller than the Steam Deck, despite being quite a bit smaller, is because it's thicker too. And so it definitely does have a more dense and sturdy quality to it than the Steam Deck, and I think it's because of that compact size. Now these iNeo devices are not the smallest ones that have the 6800U chip inside. In fact, that's the GPD Win 4. And this actually is going to be the next handheld I review. I'm hoping to get it out this weekend, but we'll see how that goes. Either way, yes, I would say the iNeo 2 is impressively small for the power and performance that we have, but it's not the smallest out there. Okay, now let's move on to talking about the controls themselves. Now, a lot of this has not changed at all. For example, with the iNeo 2, one of my major complaints was that I felt that the triggers were more like flaps than actual triggers. To me, the travel distance here is just a little bit too much. It just feels like it takes too much effort to actually press down. Now, I wouldn't call these bad triggers. In fact, they have magnetic hull sensors, which makes them very premium feeling. I just personally think the travel distance here is just a little bit too much. Now the shoulder buttons here are just fine. They feel really good, have a nice kind of soft clickiness to them. I really like them. And you know, overall, I do like the ergonomics of the iNeo 2. 
The fact that the face is very rounded like this does make it exceptionally comfortable to hold. And I also like the way that the bottom of these grips just rest naturally within the palm. Now, despite being very comfortable to hold, I don't think it's the most comfortable, and I talked about this in depth in my iNeo 2 review. But as a quick recap, because the grips are somewhat shallow, it doesn't mean you can actually grip onto the grips themselves. Instead, your fingers are going to be spread out across the back like this. And so despite the fact that they do have grips here on the back, they're nothing like what you could find on something like the Steam Deck. These grips are quite a bit more prominent, but that allows you to actually grip them very comfortably. And so holding the Steam Deck is a lot like holding a standard controller, just a lot wider. By comparison, the iNeo Geek isn't comfortable in that same way. And so the way I kind of look at it is that the iNeo Geek is very comfortable to hold and to use in most use cases. And I'd also say that all the buttons are very easy to access as well. Like I said, it's very comfortable. But when compared to something like the Steam Deck, I would say it's not as ergonomic. And honestly, the only place where I found that this manifests is when I try to play games that require me to use the trigger. For example, when playing a game, I feel that my fingers naturally rest on the shoulder buttons and not the triggers. And so when I'm playing a game that focuses on the shoulder buttons, something like Celeste, it's actually a really nice experience. But if I have a game where I can choose between the two, for example with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, you can use either the shoulder or trigger buttons, and in this case, I definitely prefer the shoulders over the triggers. And so when it comes to playing a game that uses shoulder buttons, yeah, it's super comfortable. However, when you're using something that relies more on trigger buttons, like a first-person shooter, I found that it's not as naturally ergonomic as I would like. And so this combination where it's a little bit hard to access the triggers themselves based on the ergonomics, and then also when you press on the triggers, I feel like the travel is too much, that is a slightly unpleasant experience. I would not say it's a major complaint or a deal breaker with the device, but it is definitely something I had to adapt to in my playstyle. Okay, moving on to some of the other major aspects, let's talk about the joysticks next. Now, these also have magnetic hull sensors and they feel super smooth. In fact, these are some of my favorite analog sticks of any handheld device, period. And so I'm super happy to see these sticks on the iNeo Geek as well. Now, in terms of the D-pad, I would classify this as being pretty good. It has a rubber membrane connection, which means it has a nice retro feel to it, but I would also say that the travel and the pivot are a little bit loose to me. And so by all means, when it comes to gameplay itself, I never really had any specific problems with this D-pad, but I have seen better. I would say personally, I think the rubber membrane that they're using is a little bit too soft. Also on the bottom left here, we have our start and select buttons. These are nice and clicky, no issues here. And next up, we have the face buttons. These also have a rubber membrane connection and they feel pretty good. I would say the amount of travel on them is just about right, but I've also found that they don't glide as smoothly as I would like. I wouldn't go as far as to say that there's any friction here between the case and the button itself, but it just isn't super smooth. If anything, I would say it would be a better experience if they had glossy buttons instead of the matte ones that they're using. Either way, not a huge complaint, I still think these are pretty decent buttons. Of course, the right analog stick here is exactly the same, and we have two menu buttons here on the bottom. The one on the left will bring up the IS Space Quick menu, and the one on the right will show the desktop. We'll show that in action later. Looking at the bottom, we have dual stereo speakers, as well as a headphone jack on the right, as well as an SD card slot here, too. This has a little hinge mechanism to it, and I really appreciate that they have this additional storage. Also on the bottom, we have a USB 4 port and a microphone input. Now these little caps here on the sides actually house these screws and this is what you would have to open using those stickers we showed earlier. Not a lot going on the back here other than one large fan intake here on the left. And then also we have a nice subdued logo here on the back. Another thing you may be observing is that there are some smudges on this plastic. We'll talk more about that later. For now, let's move over to the top. We have, of course, our shoulder and trigger buttons, but then we also have two different hotkeys right here. These are labeled as LC and RC and can be adjusted within the iNeo menu. Also along the left, we have our power button, which acts as a fingerprint sensor as well. And then we have our volume buttons, as well as an additional opening for a microphone, and then two more USB-C ports. And then finally, we have a heat exhaust vent here at the top. Now, a quick look at the screen before we actually turn it on. You can see here it is impressively large, but it will have some bezels. We're going to get a better idea of that once we actually turn the device on. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the smudginess that happens from the natural oils on your hands. As you can see, they're already showing up after just a couple minutes of unboxing. And fast forward about a week here after a bunch of testing, as you can see, it has not gotten any better. In fact, you can see here that all the places where my fingers touch have gotten a lot smudgier overall. And to be honest, even over the course of the week, I did wipe this down several times, but as you can see, it is quite a smudge magnet. And so while the plastic itself is nice and grippy to hold, it does get smudgy very quickly. And usually right here, I would say maybe consider a white model instead of a black one, but unfortunately, this device only comes in black or that transparent purple. And so while I haven't seen the transparent purple, 
well, if smudges aren't your thing, then maybe that's the route to go instead. Okay, now let's actually talk about the software experience. This is the iSpace app, which comes bundled with the device. And this essentially will work as a home page or launcher, and it has quite a few functions. For example, you can adjust the fan speed right here, and you can also adjust the TDP or power profile on the fly. By default, it has settings at 11 watts, 15 watts, and 22, and that usually works pretty well for most games. But there's also a pro mode if you want to adjust it even further, and this will allow you to adjust it anywhere from 3 watts all the way up to 33. And so if you wanted to really max out the power profile, you could set this to 33 watts and have that as an available option. For me personally, I always like to get the most battery life possible, and so because I play a lot of indie games on these devices anyway, I like to have one that's about 5 or 6 watts instead. Either way, it's nice to have the power profile like this easily accessible. Now the app also gives you the ability to adjust the resolution here on the fly too. But even after using the IA Space app for about a year across many different IA Neo devices, I found that this one particular option has always been very buggy. For example, if I want to adjust the resolution, it says to press the start button to apply it, but when you press the start button, it doesn't do anything. And so then I have to kill the IA Space app, and that's just a pain in the butt. And so usually what I do is I go into the Windows display settings themselves and adjust the resolution here instead. It is a couple extra clicks to get to this part, but it just makes my life a lot easier. Now within the iSpace app, there is something called the Assistant, and within here you can make additional option changes. For example, in this section here, you can adjust the strength of the rumble motors and then also set the hotkeys up here on the top. Additionally, this is where you would go to adjust the analog stick RGB lighting. By default, it's going to be set to a white light, but you can change it to any other color that you want. They also have a couple different color profiles as well, and I've showed those off in previous videos. But suffice to say, it is pretty easy to change out the colors if you'd like. Now, when it comes to daily use, I actually end up using the Steam OS interface anyway. And this is super easy to set up nowadays. All you have to do is turn on the beta version of Steam and then enter big picture mode. Anyway, this is what I use to navigate through my Steam library, and you can also add non-Steam games if you download them from Microsoft or somewhere else. Additionally, we have full functionality, so if we press that IS Space menu button here on the right, it'll bring up all those TDP settings right here. And luckily, you never really have to leave this Steam interface if you don't want to. For example, it has power settings here, so you can shut down the device right here. And so if you're primarily going to use the iNeo Geek for PC gaming, then I think this SteamOS big picture here is actually one of the best and easiest setups. And so now that we've gone over this experience, let's actually talk about PC gaming. And like I mentioned in the intro, I'm not going to spend a ton of time going over performance because it's well established at this point. But one thing I always like to talk about is the type of games that you can play at the various power profiles. And so at a 5 watt TDP, I would expect to be able to play most of those lightweight indie games no problem. And the nice thing here is that it's going to give you some pretty long battery life at this TDP. Now if we move things up here to an 11 watt TDP, we can play a lot more robust games, things like Bioshock Remastered or Grand Theft Auto V. Now for these games, I'm running them at an 800p resolution, much like you would find on the standard display of the iNeo Geek. However, within the AMD settings, I have turned on the Radeon Super Resolution, or RSR, which means it is going to naturally upscale it to a 1200p resolution. And so if you do have a 1200p resolution, this is a great way to play some of those games that are going to run better at 800p without draining the battery life at that higher TDP. For example, if I wanted to play GTA 5 at a 1200p resolution, I would have to up the TDP to 15 watts instead. And as we'll see in my battery life testing here later in the video, that's going to result in about 4 40 hours less battery life between 15 watts and 11. Now if we move up to that 15 watt TDP and keep it at that 800p resolution with the RSR settings, we can actually get some pretty good gameplay in games like Doom Eternal. Here I'm running at a pretty stable 60 frames per second on high settings. Other games like Halo Reach you could play at 15 watts and 1200p resolution and the game looks really good. Now I also tested out Street Fighter V. This one has a weird thing where MSI Afterburner won't work properly with it. And also the built-in AMD stats would actually show in a different orientation because this is actually a portrait display. And so oddly, I had to hold my finger on the screen in order to be able to show it properly like this. Either way, as you can see, a 15 watt TDP will give us an average of about 60 frames per second on Street Fighter V. Also, it's worth mentioning here that the D-pad works pretty well when it comes to fighting games. Every once in a while, I would miss one of my special moves, but for the most part, this was definitely sure you can able. Now, moving up to 22 watts is going to expand the amount of PC games that you could play, so you could be able to play some former AAA games like Rise of the Tomb Raider, and you can even play some of the more modern games like Uncharted 4. 
Now granted this is at an 800p resolution with the FSR set to quality settings, but all the same it's a really great experience and we're getting a stable 30 frames per second. And if you wanted to bump it up to a 33 watt TDP, then the sky's the limit. Basically any game that you can think of will be able to play at least moderately well at that TDP. Just bear in mind that it will heavily tax your battery life too. Now moving over to emulation, when it came to most of the retro systems, I used an app called Retrobat. This one will come bundled with all those basic emulators and it has a very nice interface as well. And so when it comes to playing retro games, this is what I would recommend using if you don't want to do all that configuration yourself. Either way, one of the benefits of having a 16x10 aspect ratio display like this is that many retro games are going to look really good. For example, something like Game Boy Advance with a 3x2 aspect ratio was going to fill up basically the full screen. Even the systems that had a more narrow aspect ratio, like the original Game Boy, are still going to look pretty good. And then of course 4x3 content, like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and arcade games, these are all going to look great too. And all these systems are going to work really well at a 5 watt TDP, which means you're going to get great battery life. Now if you want to try some of those 3D based systems like PSP and bump up that resolution to match the display, then it is going to take a little bit more battery. For example, with PSP at a 4x resolution or 1080p, it is going to require 11 watts. And same thing in general when it comes to GameCube and PS2 emulation. These at a 3x resolution will be at a 1080p display, but in general you'll have to use between 11 and 15 watts to get most games to work well. And if you're willing to bump down the resolution to say the native resolution, then you could probably get some better battery life and maybe find a TDP that works better, maybe something around 7 or 8. When it comes to Wii U and PS3, I found that 15 watt TDP seems to be about the sweet spot here for the native resolution for these games. Of course, depending on the game, you will have to bump up that TDP in order to get it to play smoothly, but you can kind of experiment with that to find what works best. And I'm not going to do a ton of emulation in this video because I did it in previous videos, but I will mention that for Switch, you'll have to go one step further. And so most games will work better at either a 22 watt TDP or cranked up all the way to 33. And the nice thing about the Yuzu emulator is that it'll throttle back that TDP if it doesn't need to use all 33. And so for example with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe you can see it's hovering around 29, 30 watts altogether. Another thing I mentioned at the beginning of the video is I really appreciate using a dock with the iNeo Geek 2. After all this is a handheld Windows PC. And so as you can see with this setup right here I'm actually using my monitor as an extended display and then running Steam from there. Additionally I have my 2.4 GHz 8-bit Do Ultimate controller hooked up as well and so all I have to do is just pull this controller off of its dock and I can immediately start controlling my Steam like this. And this is a really nice setup if you wanted to have something on the actual main display showing here, like maybe your email or something while also playing games, you could totally do that. And then of course in the window settings, if you just wanted to turn the iNeo Geek screen off while you're playing on a monitor, you could do that too. Either way, it makes it a very nice experience if you wanted to use this device both for gaming as well as just for regular Windows functions. I think the combination here of the iNeo Geek's processor as well as this multi-dock station means that you could use this as your main PC if you'd like. Okay, and finally, let's talk a little bit about battery life. And to be honest, I didn't do a ton of testing here because it's the exact same battery and screen as my iNeo 2. And so I'm going to do a bit of a cop out here and just show you my iNeo 2 battery life testing. In a nutshell, you can get anywhere from about one hour to all the way past four hours, depending on the settings that you're using. Personally, when it comes to playing games at a 33 watt TDP, I would usually just reserve those for when you're playing it in docked mode so that you don't drain the battery too fast. And so when playing at a 22 watt TDP, I would expect about an hour and a half of battery life, but the sweet spot really is between 11 and 15. And so depending on the type of game that you're playing or emulating, you can get quite a bit of battery life. One note here with the iNeo 2 testing is that I did play most of these games at a 1200p resolution. And so like I mentioned with the Grand Theft Auto 5 section, if you want to extend the battery life, you can reduce that to 800p and then probably knock down the TDP too. And so instead of 2 hours and 8 minutes at a 1200p resolution with GTA 5, you could get 2 hours and 48 minutes with an 11 watt TDP. Okay, so with all those impressions and testing out of the way, let's get into what I like and what I don't like about the iNeo Geek. And we'll start with what I like, and number one is that this is a very elegant machine. I think that a lot of time was spent in the design and testing of it, and it shows. As soon as you pick the device up, it really does scream high quality. When it comes to controls, I would classify them as being good. The D-pad and the face buttons aren't really worth complaining about, but they're not absolutely perfect. Meanwhile, I would say the analog sticks are the star of the show here. They are super smooth and fun to use. Additionally, I love the performance that you can get on the 6800U chipset that is found in the iNeo Geek. You can basically play every game you'd like. 
It's really going to come down to that balance between power profile and the resolution. Additionally, as I showed here, and this is the same with the iNeo 2, this device is very good when docked. And so if you are thinking about getting a handheld PC to also use as your main PC hooked up to a monitor, this is a really nice experience. Now, of course, this device is not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I don't like about the iNeo Geek. And each of these things I've kind of mentioned already, but the trigger travel here is just a little bit more than I would like. I appreciate that they're using magnetic hall sensor analog triggers, but at the same time, I just feel like I shouldn't have to press down on them so far. Additionally, I'm not a big fan of the smudgy plastic that they're using here. I like that it's grippy, but all the same, it just looks ugly after a few minutes of use. And so in this case, I wish they also offered a white model to kind of hide those smudges a little bit better. Now, like with any other x86 based handheld, the battery life is not going to be great. And so depending on how you're playing it, I would expect to get maybe two to four hours of gameplay altogether. And finally, let's talk a little bit about pricing. After all, this is $850 right now, and it'll go up to $950 when it goes to retail. And that, of course, is quite a lot of money to throw at a single device. Now, granted, you're getting a lot of value in that price and the fact that you're getting a handheld PC that has a nice screen and nice buttons and controls and also a pretty hefty battery, too. And that's not to mention the fact that it has the best mobile processor you can get, and so it's going to be able to play just about every game available right now. Now, of course, even at the lowest price of $850, it's still $200 more than the highest spec Steam Deck. Now, in my iNeo 2 review, I actually did a full breakdown between the Steam Deck and the iNeo 2, and most of those points still stand. And so if you haven't seen that part of the iNeo 2 review, I would recommend checking that out, but here's a quick summary. As you can see, there are quite a few advantages either for the Steam Deck or the iNeo 2. It's really going to come down to your personal use case. And so if you want a device that has a more Windows-based experience and a better chipset, then maybe one of these iNeo devices might be a better fit. And so yes, while I do think the iNeo Geek is an expensive piece of hardware, it is actually getting more and more closer to what you can get when it comes to value compared to the Steam Deck. And so at the end of the day, if you take in all those factors in consideration and you think the iNeo Geek might be the device for you, then I'm at least happy to say that yeah, you might be right. Because when it comes down to it, the iNeo Geek does deliver on all the promises that it made. With the exception of a couple things that I could nitpick like the analog triggers and the smudgy plastic, I really enjoyed my time with the iNeo Geek. And so in the end, I do recommend the iNeo Geek if you are looking for a Windows-based PC and you want all of those factors that we just mentioned earlier. At the end of the day, this is a really nice piece of tech as long as you're in the market for something at this price. And so let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this about the right price for what you're getting or are you going to wait for something better down the line? As we've seen over the past couple of years, these things just keep getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. And I'm always interested to hear what actually is the tipping point for most of my viewers. So let me know in the comments below what you think. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.